Father, we thank you uh, for this day, this gorgeous day, this beautiful day uh, that you have given us and you have allowed us to see, which indicates that your faithfulness, your mercy and your grace is still active in our lives. And despite what's going on in this world, we have gathered here to demonstrably denote that you're still worthy and we still need your word. Bless Pastor Wardlow as he conveyed to us what you have put on his heart to edify us, to empower us, to uplift us. We need it today. We need it. We need it. I pray for the Lighthouse family. I pray for everyone who's viewing uh, this worship service. Bless them, God, according to your riches and glory. And God, we ask that you would have your way, save those who need to be saved, heal those who need to be healed, deliver those who need to be delivered, and free those who need the freedom that only you can give. This is my prayer. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless. Good morning, Lighthouse family and friends. I'd like to welcome you all and thank you all for tuning in to our Sunday morning worship service. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed for his compassions fail not. His mercies are new every morning and great is the Lord's faithfulness. For I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And one more for you today, for this is the day. Today is the day that the Lord has made. Let us all rejoice. That means every single last one of you, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whatever situation that you find yourself in, let us all rejoice. Let us all rejoice rejoice and and let's not forget that and be glad in it we should be glad that the lord has woke us up with new mercies today his compassions fail not the lord i don't know who they were but i know the lord has invited us all and said all of you come into the house of the lord and remember he always says that today every day that we wake up that this is the day this is a day that the lord has preordained so therefore, this is a day that he has made. This is a day that he has decided already before the foundation of the world that he wanted you and I to be here. Therefore, we should always rejoice and be glad in it. I am so thankful and grateful that the Lord has given me another day to stand here before you um, as a messenger. As a messenger, I have been afforded the opportunity to be a messenger as a voice piece um, to get to express or get to verbalize the word of the Lord for you all on this morning and I do not take it lightly I am so grateful to the father I am so grateful to his son Jesus Christ and his life that he has given for me that allows me the opportunity a man that is unworthy I was unworthy then and I am definitely I am just as unworthy today I am only here because of the Lord's grace and his mercy and I thank him for that um, today, if you will, you can meet me in the book of Hebrews and the book of Hebrews and uh, we will be looking at chapter four and just covering uh, two, three short verses, verses 14 through 16 on today. That is the book of Hebrews chapter four, verses 14 through 16. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop Robinson, for your word of prayer and encouragement on this morning. I am so thankful for you um, and who you have been to me and my life. And I thank the Lord for you. And may he continue to grow and strengthen you, um, your ministry and your family as well. I am grateful to the Lord God for you and your service on this morning. Thank you again. The book of Hebrews chapter four, the book of Hebrews chapter four, verses 14 through 16, and I will be reading from the ESV, and the Bible reads, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. 
Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Lord God, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for your word in your son, Christ Jesus, who took upon flesh and dwelt amongst us and walked amongst us to show us that we can live a godly life that now through him we can not only live a godly life here on earth but it is also through and because of him that we will be able to live with you for eternity so father i am forever grateful for your written word and your living word that is living inside of all of us on today Lord, it is my prayer that anything that may be a hindrance or distracting to your people that would present itself to stop them from hearing your word on this morning. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you will bind and hold and rebuke and turn away anything that would represent or present itself against the knowledge of who you are are. Father, if there's someone who are, is in need of healing, someone that's in the need of deliverance, someone may, may be in need of a savior through your son, Christ Jesus. Father, it is my prayer that you would be every and anything that anyone may need on today. And Lord, lastly, but certainly not least, Lord, for all of the people that are hearing your word today, not just those who are tuning in to this broadcast for the Lighthouse on the Pike Church, but Lord, for anyone that is tuning in to any church in any broadcast, live or in person or social media, whatever platform that they are listening today, Lord, it is my prayer that you would draw and teach your people to be not only hearers of your word, but Lord, teach us all to be better doers of it. And Father, I ask these things in the name of your son, Christ Jesus. It is my prayer. Amen. Let us look at verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The book of Hebrews was written to a group of Jewish believers they were in danger of turning away from Christ because of the persecution they were facing from their fellow countrymen. The writer who is unknown, even though some like to accredit this writing to the likes of the Apostle Paul, but the writer is unknown. However, he exhorts them to go on to maturity. See, this book, this writing of Hebrews is a book that is about maturity. So the writer exhorts them to go on to maturity. He does this by dwelling on the person of Christ. He shows that Jesus is better than the prophets. He shows that Jesus is better than the angels, that Jesus is better than Moses, that Jesus is better than Aaron, referring to the priesthood. He shows that Jesus instituted a better covenant on better promises, that Jesus offers a better sanctuary, and Jesus himself is the better and perfect sacrifice. In our lesson today, we will see the writer, he separates this book of Hebrews, which we will not cover in its entirety. He covers this in two sections. The first section, chapters 1 through 10, is a book primarily of doctrine. It's a, book, it's a doctrinal section, and it shows that maturity is only because of the preeminence of the Son, that the Son is superior to all and anything that came before him, that the Son is it's, it's preeminent over the prophet, that the son is preeminent over the angels, that the son is preeminent, superior over Moses, that the son is superior over Aaron and the priesthood. The second or the latter half 
of the book of Hebrews is a book of practicality and it deals with the practicality or that one has the ability to become mature because of the practical application of the son Christ Jesus. Not only did Jesus or not only was Jesus preeminent or Jesus superior over the doctrinal issues, but Jesus became superior through his actions as well. And likewise, through him, you and I can follow this model that he has left before us. The writer here tells us in our section today that we have a high priest, that we have a high priest that is passed through the heavens. And he lets us know who this high priest is, that it is Jesus, the son of God. Therefore, we should hold fast to our confession. Now, the writer of the book of Hebrews did not write this letter to us as you and I today. He wrote it, as I mentioned earlier in my introduction, he wrote it to a group of Jewish believers, to a group of Jewish believers who were in danger these, this, this group of Jewish believers, these, this, this group of people who at once followed and lived and abided by the laws of Moses, those who had lived according to the law, are now believers in this new way or now believers in who you and I will call the Lord Jesus Christ. They are now believers, but yet they find themselves or they're in a place in life where now they're at a predicament where they're turning away from the gospel that has been preached to them. Why is it that they're turning away? Because they're facing persecution from their fellow countrymen, their brothers and sisters, their neighbors that's on the left or to the right of them. They're suffering persecution and now they're at a place in life. They're at a place in their walk where now they are in danger of turning away. And this is what the letter, this is what the writer of this letter is warning them of in the first verse is not to turn away. It's not to turn away from what it is that they believe. So much so, he goes on to explain to them, he goes on to explain to them that everything about their past beliefs and not that it was wrong, and not that it was wrong because the prophets did serve a very, very, very important role in the life or the relationship between God and man. The prophets served a great responsibility between God and man. Likewise, the angels as well were part of God's creation. They're part of the heavenly host. And the angels served a critical role in God's mission and his relationship with man. And then we see the first prophet of the Bible, Moses, the first one who became a mouthpiece for God directly to his people, the prophet Moses. We see Moses played a very important role in the exodus of God's people. It was Moses who served of a like God figure to deliver his people from oppression of the Egyptians. And then we see that Moses had assistance with Aaron and his sons and his priesthood in the governing of God's people. Moses, Aaron and his sons served as the first priest of the Lord's holy temple. But the writer of Hebrews said that even though all of these things is true and this was God's choice and God's election to use these people, but now we have a more excellent way and this way is Jesus Christ. And that Jesus, that Jesus, that Jesus is superior. That the preeminence of the Son of God is far more greater than any of these things or any of these people that was created. For all things that was created was created through him. And the writer of Hebrew goes back to explain us to that. And likewise, you and I can find comfort in this and knowing that yes, we do serve an almighty God. And yes, we do serve under um, doctrinal issues. And yes, we do serve through the ecclesiastics of church. And we do serve through all of these things. And we do have pastors and we do have deacons and we have all of these positions and we do follow our Bible and we do study the Old Testament and the teachings about Moses. We do study about God and his angels. We do study about the prophets who are mouthpiece for God. 
We do study about Aaron and the priesthood, which is how we've come about today to having leaders within our church. We do speak about all of these things. But the writer of Hebrews lets us know that Jesus is far more superior than any of these things. That Jesus, if we was to bring this in a, in a more current view today, that Jesus, even though we have people in our churches today that title themselves, some are self-titled. It is what it is. But some are actually the, the, the Lord God through the Holy Spirit has given this office to some people. And there are those who are voices that actually do speak what the Lord is saying. But even for those people, what we can grasp from the book of Hebrews on this morning, that Jesus is far more superior or Jesus' preeminence is greater than any prophet that can come speak to you. How is that? For Jesus himself tells us that the Holy Spirit comes and that the Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us to all truth and all understanding. We find out through the writings of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians that the Holy Spirit does give spiritual gifts. And we understand that the prophetic gift is one of those gifts of the Holy Spirit. However, here's what we do know that Jesus says in the Gospel of John that he, the Holy Spirit, only speaks what it is that he hears. Likewise, if the Holy Spirit is using any one of us, if he's using you and you're speaking what the Holy Spirit says to you, he's only speaking what it is that he's hearing from the Son. Therefore, the Son is far more superior than the writer of Hebrews referring to the prophets of the Old Testament. But Jesus is far more superior to any prophet. Likewise, we see God using his angels, his angels. He had messenger angels. He had warring angels. He had worshiping angels. But we see here in the first chapter of Hebrews, verses 5 through 14, and in chapter 2, verses 5 through 18, that the writer says that Jesus is far more superior than the angels. He says that Jesus is far more superior to the angels. He says, for which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, and today I have begotten you, or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Or of the angels, he makes his angels winds and his ministers flame of fire. So Jesus, we find out, is more superior than the angels. And then here it is, we have the great prophet Moses, the leader of the Exodus, the one whom God called to lead his people to the promised land. We see in chapter 3 that the writer says, For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house, as more honor than the house itself. For Moses was just the house, but the builder of the house was the Lord Jesus himself. And likewise, the genesis of the priesthood began in Aaron. But we see in chapter 4, Verse 14, that Jesus is far, far more superior than the angels, which is our text today. I mean, then the, then the priesthood, he says, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, see Aaron and his sons that never passed through the heavens. And Jesus is the high priest for the high priest was only able to go into the presence of God once a year and sprinkle blood for the sins of his people. But likewise, he had to present blood for himself. And that blood only lasted for one year. For the next year, they had to go in and do it all over again. But how many of you know that because of the blood of Jesus Christ, that we're covered forever and ever, that there should be no more sacrifices of blood. And therefore, Jesus becomes more superior than Aaron. Jesus is far more superior. If we look at the priesthood today, Jesus is far more superior than your pastor. Oh, I'm probably getting in trouble right now. Jesus is far more superior than your pastor. It does not matter how long he or she has been a pastor. Jesus, as your pastor today, me, is far more superior than me. For all things that are created are created through him. And Jesus was from, he was from the beginning. He was in the beginning. For in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Jesus is far more superior than anything here on earth created. So since we have a high priest, and not only a high priest, a great high priest, 
who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, who is the Son of God, the writer says that let us hold fast to our confession. Let us hold fast to our confession this morning that Jesus Christ is Lord, the great high priest. Now watch this. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize. He's not able to sympathize with what? <laughs> Our weakness. We do not have a high priest who does not have the ability to sympathize with our weakness. First and foremost, we recognize Jesus as high priest. But Jesus as high priest, he sympathizes with our weaknesses, the Bible tells us today. That Jesus has compassion, or Jesus understands everything about you and I. Everything that is about you and I that presents itself or a weakness, those things that would hinder us, the Bible tells us that Jesus sympathizes with us. It's the first thing we see from this. And not only does he sympathize with us, but here's how he's able to sympathize with us. Because in every way, in every way, in every way, the writer tells us that he himself, that in every respect has been tempted just as we are. I know some of you like to read your King James Version, and that probably didn't sound right to you because you're used to quoting it in the King James. That we have a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings. We do not have a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but with was in all points tempted as we are, and yet is without sin. We have a Lord. See, Jesus, Jesus is not like, Buddha or Jesus is not like the, 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 the God of, the, of Baal and Jesus is not like all of the idols that was being worshipped. Jesus is not any dead and mute God who does not have the ability to be able to sympathize and feel what it is that their followers were feeling. For God himself from the foundations of the world had already set up that Jesus would come in the flesh. But God, in his desire to wanting to lead by example, God, in his desire to, be, to want to feel what it is that his human creations would feel, decided that he would take his word and allow it to take upon flesh and dwell and walks among men, is what the Gospel of John tells us. So therefore, because the word became flesh, Jesus has the ability or not a, to sympathize with us in our weakness because there was a part of him that he suffered in his weakness in the flesh as well. So much so, the Bible tells us that, watch this, I know you all never thought about Jesus in this way, but the Bible says, I didn't say it, the Bible says, verse 15, that he was tempted just as we are. I'm going to pause because if you can think of it, Jesus thought of it too. If you can feel it, whatever that feeling is, whatever that thought is, from the cleanest to the nastiest thought that you have, the Bible says that the Lord Jesus was tempted in every manner of sin, just like you and I. Therefore, he's able to sympathize with us in his weakness and our weaknesses. He understands what it is that you and I feel. He understands what it is that you and I go through on a daily basis. He understands what James says that when a man is tempted, and that's you too, women, that man means mankind. He understands that when a man is tempted, how he's dragged away and enticed by his own desires, for Jesus had desire too. Remember, the Bible tells us that he was led, that he was led out by the Holy Spirit to fast for 40 days. Just in this natural state, Jesus went without food and water for 40 days. Which tells us something that A, he was hungry, and B, he was thirsty. For 40 days, Jesus went without food and water. Now, it wasn't his choice. The Bible tells us that he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to fast for 40 days and to be tempted of the devil. So just in this natural aspect, the Lord Jesus was hungry and thirsty, and it was of the Lord's will. It was of the Father's will that he went without food and drink. So he had a natural desire. He had a natural desire. Some of us can't go 15 minutes without eating. It's a joke. Probably more or less 10. But the Lord went for 40 days without eating or drinking. 
And the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit led him. And soon as he got to that point, what do we see? The devil shows up and decides what is the, what is the devil tempted with? Food. But the Lord sold him. And he says that, hey, 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 the devil tells the Lord that if you are the son of God, why don't you turn these stones into bread? And the Lord Jesus' response to him was that man should not live off bread alone, but off every word that proceeded from the mouth of God, because he understood that it was the word of the Lord that was going to ultimately give him life. And that the word of the Lord was, had preeminence, was more superior over just food alone. So yet, the Lord was tempted in every single fashion, in every single manner that you and I are or will face today. What does that tell us for the person that says, well, God, that's God, or for the person that says, well, that's Jesus, you know, he's the son of God. Of course, he doesn't have the problem. He wouldn't have the problems, or of course, he wouldn't understand what it is that we're going through. No, the Bible says that that's not true, that in every manner of temptation that you and I face, that the Lord Jesus faced those exact same temptations, that he faced those exact same temptations, and therefore he's able to sympathize with us in our weaknesses. He understands what it feels like to be hungry. He understands what it feels like to be thirsty. He understands Matthew chapter 6 verses 33. Do not worry what you should eat, what you should wear, where you should drink. He understands what it means or what it feels like to have a place of security that we will call home. His response to that was the son of man or foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. He understands the natural needs that every single human being has. Yes. Those are just a few, but again, I'll say it again. And anything that you can think of the Lord was tempted in every manner, yet he did not displease the Father. He always, that's what that word, but yet was without sin. He never, he never missed the mark of the Father. He always did what the Father's will was. Hence, we have what we call the Lord's Prayer, but it's really the believer's prayer that, Lord, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let your will be done as it is in heaven. But so the Bible tells us today that we have a high priest. We serve. We serve a high priest that not only has passed through the heavens, he is the son of God. And this is the reason why we have to hold fast to our confession. For he's able to sympathize with us in our weaknesses because he has been tempted in every manner, but yet he is without sin. Now, verse 16, verse 16 says, so therefore, for it says, let us, but that's the same thing as therefore, let us, let all of us with confidence because of this, because we know that we serve a Lord that has gone before us and done it. So he's not just the Lord or he's not, he's, he's not one of those leaders that just stands and tells us to do where he himself have not done. You know, the kind, the kind, just like the bark orders, we've all had some of those leaders. Some of you all may be that particular leader, not just in church, but whatever you may have responsibility. You know, when you just stand and you just manage and you just supervise and you just point your finger and you want everybody else to get their hands dirty, but you yourself have not. He says, that's not the type of Lord that we follow. He, we have one that has gone through this so much so to the point of death which was the Father's will, so he has been tempted in every single manner, yet he has found himself without sin. And because of this, he says, now the writer says, well, let us all, therefore, we should, with confidence, therefore, with confidence, we should draw near to the throne of grace. What does that mean? With confidence means that we should be able to come through the, to the throne of grace with no doubt, undoubting, because why, why can we come to the throne of grace is because our relationship with him opposed to being covered with the shame. So he said, therefore, we should be able to come with confidence. We should be able to come with our head held high, with the surety. Now, not, now, not with our head held high, because let's not get this twisted. This is not because I don't want anybody to take this word out of context today. Well, Jesus understands me, therefore, he understands and he already knew that I was going to do this. He already knew that I was going to make these decisions. No, this does not give us a license to go against the will of God. This does not give us a license to sin. 
because that's not what it says. It says that he sympathizes with us and our weaknesses. You know those areas where we're weak at. There's some things we're strong in. There's some things we can fight off. Don't even think about it. But everybody has a weakness. Superman himself had a weakness. Some of you all think Superman weakness was kryptonite. No, I, I, I beg, I, I beg to disagree. I think it was Lois Lane. <laughs> it's a joke. But no, everybody had, has a weakness. And it says that the Lord has the ability to sympathize with us because He's been tempted just like we are. So he knows what it is that we're going through, but that does not give us a license to go and do it. Because like him, it says that yet he was without sin. So your greatest temptation, the Lord had it as well. The Lord had it as well, but yet he was without sin. So therefore, because he was without sin, the Bible tells us that now we should be able to come in confidence. Come in confidence of what? That when we come to him, because of our relationship with him, we can come to him not doubting, not doubting that we can find two things. We should come to him in confidence, knowing that we will find two things that A, we will receive mercy and B, that we will find grace. And both the grace and mercy, the Bible tells us, will help us in our need. So now because of our relationship with him, we can come knowing and because we know not only our relationship with him, but because we know that he's already done it before us and he's here to strengthen us and encourage us, we can come with boldness and confidence, not arrogance and not pride, but we can come with boldness and confidence knowing because of our relationship that we're going to get two things, that we may receive mercy, that we may receive God's kindness and his goodwill toward the miserable and the afflicted. It's God's kindness and his goodwill toward those who are miserable and afflicted. That's you and I. We're miserable. We're in this flesh. I know. I know some of us are living our best life in this flesh. But no, we're miserable and yet we are still afflicted. But God's mercy is God's, his kindness and his goodwill toward those who see themselves at that way. Remember, Jesus says, I did not come. I come for the sick, not those who are well. I come for those who are in need of a physician. And he was talking to the religious sector who thought more of themselves and thought that they did not need help. And if you're someone today that's sitting there to think that you do not need the Lord's help, well, then maybe this word isn't for you. I'm here to talk to somebody that understands that apart from Jesus Christ, that you're nothing. And that I, apart from Jesus Christ, I'm nothing. But apart from Jesus Christ, I am just a sinner. And I have to recognize every day that I am in need of God's mercy and his grace. So when I find myself in places of weakness, whatever that weakness may be, A, I know that the Lord understands because he's been there. But B, because he understands and, and, and because he's been there, now I have the ability to approach God's throne through him. Knowing that I am in need of his mercy. I am in need of his kindness and his goodwill toward me, the one that is miserable and afflicted. But what his mercy is, is not only his kindness and his goodwill toward those people, but it's also joined with his desire to help him. See, the Lord desires to help every single last one of us. He desires to help every single last one of us, but he requires something from us. And that is that we must first understand that we are in need of him. We must, we can't think high, higher than ourselves. I know I'm not, you, you say that you, you think that you're more than that. I, that that's not my confession today. My confession today is know that apart from the Lord Jesus Christ that I'm miserable and I'm afflicted and I'm a, I am always in need of him. So the Lord's desire to help those who see themselves is that way. That's called this is mercy. Now, understand that his mercy is undeserving. None of us deserve his mercy. And likewise, not only will I find mercy that I may receive mercy, but also I am able to come boldly or with confidence to his throne looking for grace. His grace is his favor, his blessedness, his pardon of my offense. I can come with confidence knowing that I'm seeking out the Lord's mercy. I'm seeking out his goodwill and his desire to help me. And I'm also looking for his favor and him giving me a pardon of my offense toward him. 
And both of these things are equally, have equally in common that neither one of them are deserving of either one of us. We don't deserve it. We only are able to obtain it through his son, our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. And all of this he talks about. For every high priest is chosen from among men, chapter 5, verse 1, and is appointed to act on the behalf of men in relation to God. Jesus himself was appointed to this position by God to act on the behalf of you and I. And all of this is what he's talking about is about one thing. And it's not my message today, but it is a place for me to close. That remember, I told you in the, intro in the introduction that this book of Hebrews is a book or a writing that's telling the people to let us go on to maturity. As a matter of fact, the ESV reads, they let us leave this elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. Every single last one of us, ladies and gentlemen, we have to go on to maturity. We have to grow. We have to mature. We have to grow up in God, is what the writer is telling us. And we're able to do this because Jesus has already done it. So therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ. It is time for us to grow up. Now, remember, remember the people, this letter was written to a group of people that have began to turn away from God because of their persecution. And likewise, it's no indictment of any one of you. But I believe that a lot of us are beginning to subtly lose confidence in the faith. Some of us have turned or began to turn. Now, when I say that, it does not mean that I'm saying that you're sinning. But we are beginning to take a posture where we're turning away because we've been out of our churches for so long. We have not been able to come and quote unquote fellowship with one another. We have not been able to come together and hear music. We have not been able to come together and have church. That now some of us, our postures are different. We're not waking up early in the morning or even the night before preparing ourselves to go to church the next day. As a matter of fact, some of you are just rolling over now. You're tuning in late because you stayed up late last night when before, when it was about the building and it was about the people and it was about having church. No, some of you, now some of you were late anyway, but some of you were the first ones there. But now your posture toward him is different because we're going into the early days of September and we haven't been to church since March. It may not be persecution in this particular manner, but it is something that has distracted or turned us away. Well, some of us are starting to lose confidence in God. Some of us are not reading our Bibles anymore. Some of us are not praying. Some of us are not tuning into anybody's church. So likewise, we become like this group of believers who are now losing hope or now losing faith. And the writer of Hebrews is telling us that it's time to mature. It's time to get past all of those doctrines of old. Why? Because Jesus, you didn't think I wasn't going anywhere because Jesus is far more superior than any church building. Jesus is far more superior than your church. Jesus is far more superior than your pastor. Jesus is far more superior than any prophet that you can listen to. Jesus is far more superior than the angels. And it is because of the Lord Jesus Christ that now we have to grow into maturity. And he tells us, chapter 6, verse 1, that it's time for us to leave these elementary things. All of these things, it served the point. If we just look at the natural process of life, we all started off in elementary school, but you could not stay in elementary school. You would have been talked about being 18 years old, still in the fifth grade. You would have been talked about. You got talked about for if you got left behind. I'm not making a joke if that's any of you testimony, but if you grew up in a time where I grew up, and a lot of you maybe is probably older than me, it's not so much like it is now where you can't say anything about anybody. But when we grew up, you got talked about if you got skipped over and you had to stay in the grade all over again. So you definitely did not want to be a teenager. You definitely did not want to be 15, 16 years old sitting in the classroom in the sixth grade going to lunch and recess and things of that nature. 
He did not want to do that. And the writer here is telling the people all of this, all the, the, all the, the all all 13 chapters of the book of Hebrews, you can find the point of it right here in chapter 6, verse 1. It says, therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ. Let us grow past these elementary things. Let us grow past these questions. And then if you have this question, it's, 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 it's okay. It's okay, but you can't stay there. If you are of the belief that the Lord Jesus does not know where you're at, if you are of the belief that the Lord Jesus does not know how you're feeling, if you are of the belief that the Lord Jesus does not know that you're feeling away and what that feels like about things that you want to do or things that you're being pulled to do or things that you're thinking about, the Bible tells us, no, that he does, he understands and he sympathizes with you and your weakness because he had the same issue, but yet he found himself without sin. Therefore, it is time for us to leave past the elementary doctrines of Christ. It is time for us to move past. The days are gone. Now, I'm not speaking as a prophet, but we don't know when we're going to come back to any of our churches. We don't know what it's going to look like once we're able to do that. Those days in the past of how we're used to doing things is just that. It's in the past. It was yesterday. Moving forward to tomorrow or moving forward in maturity, he says, let us not lay again the foundation of repentance from dead works and from faith toward God and of instructions about washings and laying on of the hands and resurrections of the dead and eternal judgment. The days are gone about all of those old ways and that we used to do, think, and even preach about in church. The Bible says that we have to mature and move past those elementary doctrines of Christ. And now it's time that we go on to the higher levels or the higher education, if you will, just for practical purpose and learn some greater things about Jesus Christ because Jesus himself has preeminence over anything that you can think about, any way that you were used to coming into your sanctuaries and worshiping, any way that you were used to hearing the word of God presented, any way, anything that you can think of, the Bible tells us today that Jesus is far more superior to any of those things. And if you find yourself, if you find yourself as I close, like the people who was received this letter, this 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 this, 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 this group of Jewish believers who had began to turn away from God because of their situations. I just come today to leave you with the word of encouragement as we work toward maturity. <laughs> that you can rest assured that you have a high priest who sympathizes with you. He understands where you're at. Now, again, I must say this is not a license for us to go off and do whatever because that's not what it's talking about. But it lets you know that the Lord understands where you're at. The Lord knows what you're feeling. He does. Not because he's heard about it or somebody or because you told him about it. No, because he's gone through it himself. He has been tempted in every single form of fashion in any matter that you and I could think of, just like us. But the Bible says that yet he was without sin. So you can take confidence that the Lord understands where you are. And because we're after his grace and his mercy, it says that we can approach him. We can approach his throne of grace with confidence that we may receive his mercy and his grace in our time of need. The Lord knows exactly where you are. He knows exactly what you're feeling. He knows exactly what it is you're going through. He knows your gains. He knows your losses. He knows your weaknesses. But the Lord desires to help you in your time of need. It is your responsibility. It is my responsibility that all we need to do is draw near to him. Father God, I thank you for your word on today. Lord, I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ who has come as the great high priest, Lord, and has put himself in a position that he could feel everything that I would feel today, that he would um, go through anything that I could go through today so he would have the ability to sympathize with me and be able to go on my behalf, on my behalf, and intercede for me. So, Lord, I thank you for him. It is my prayer today that your people, anybody that has heard this message on today, we we'll go to him in confidence, knowing that you do not condemn us, Lord, that you understand where we are. You don't want us to stay there, but Lord, that you have a desire to help us out. 
Lord, it's my prayer today that anything that we have in, uh, gone through in the last few months, Lord, that have turned our hearts ever so gently, ever so subtly, turned us away from you, Lord, that we would turn back to you in confidence knowing that you desire to help us, that you desire to give us grace and mercy in our time of need. Lord, it is my prayer today that if there's someone that's listening to this that does not know you as their Lord or as their Savior, Lord, it is my prayer that they would today accept you in their heart, Lord, and confess with their mouth that you're Lord. And Lord, confess. They may not understand everything, but Lord, that they would confess that you died for their sins, that you took the penalty that they deserved. And Lord, that now you sit at the right hand of the Father and that you intercede on our behalf. Father, I ask these things in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus. This is my prayer. Amen. Amen. If you do not know the Lord as your Savior, the Lord Jesus as your Savior, the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth and believe with your heart, if you believe with your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, that you would be saved. If you feel that pulling today, if something that was said to you today, or if the Lord has just been talking to you, you've been feeling the pull all week, that is the Lord. It is not me. It is of the Lord. Would you confess him on today? Would you confess him on today? And if that is your confession, please find you a Bible-based church, a Bible-believing church. Please find you a Bible-believing church, whether it's this one or someone else that's broadcasting a service, and become a part of it. Become involved in any way um, that you can at this particular point. It's good to be um, around other like believers as we get discipled and learn more about the Lord Jesus Christ. If you would like to be a member of the Lighthouse on the Pike Church, send us an email to info at the lighthouse on the pike dot org. That's info at the lighthouse on the pike dot org and someone will return your message expeditiously. Also, if you would like to give to the lighthouse on the pike church, please visit our website at the lighthouse on the pike dot org. That's the lighthouse on the pike dot org. Or if you would like to mail in a check, you can mail it to the lighthouse on the pike. And our address is 5904 Marlboro Pike. That's 5904 Marlboro Pike. Remember, remember every Thursday, every Thursday across the hall in our classroom is our Bible study at 7 p.m. Please forgive me for this past Thursday. I don't know what happened. We were experiencing uh, technical difficulties, so our service didn't get up to late. Um, but it is posted now. If you missed it, you can go back and watch last week's, last week's Bible study or any one before that or any one of our Sunday services. So every Thursday, 7 p.m. is Bible study across the hall. And then again, every Sunday at 11 a.m., every Sunday at 11 a.m. right here in the sanctuary is our Sunday morning worship service. That is all that I have for you today. If it is the Lord's will, I will see you all next week. Now unto him who is able to present yourself faultless before his presence with exceeding joy to the only wise God be glory and majesty, dominion and power now and forever and let the people of God say amen. Blessings to you all.